His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told keep on dance for never get old. Hello and welcome to the Long Island History Project, the podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz. I am your host, and our opening music is courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. You know, if you're not from Long Island or from certain parts of it, some of what we talk about on this podcast may be unfamiliar to you. Places like Patchogue or East Mariches, Mount Misery. But today we're talking about a part of the island I think almost everyone in the country has heard of. But if all you know about it is what you've seen on TV or read in the papers, then you don't know it at all. We're talking today with two people who love it, who celebrate it, who lament its passing. So let's head out east with them and start talking about our Hamptons with our two very special guests. Hi, my name is Erwin Levy, and uh, I am the co-host of Our Hamptons podcast. And hello, I'm Esperanza Leon, and I am an East Hampton resident living in Wainscott and a proud co-host of Our Hamptons podcast with Erwin Levy. Great, and thank you both for joining us. We're on Libsyn Connect tonight. Um, and it's it's funny, I interviewed a, a listener a couple of months ago, and when he first called me, he was like, oh, my God, it's your voice. And I can say that to the two of you. Ah. Like, wow, it's really your voices because I've been listening to every episode pretty oh, well, much. Well, thank so. you. Well, thank you for that, Chris. So just to set the stage geographically and, and metaphorically for the Our Hamptons conversation, how many Hamptons are there? Oh, gosh, I have to count on my fingers. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, you know, okay, we're, go- we're going to, hey, Esperanza, I'm going, to, I'm going to answer this in a slick sort of way. We have the town of East Hampton and the town of Southampton. Good answer. Okay, so you're, you're sticking with those. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, if we start getting involved in Hamlets, we're going to get in a lot of trouble. Well, yeah, and the truth of the matter is that, you know, Amagansett is not a Hampton, you know, so that's, there is that, or Montauk for that matter. That's a great point Esperanza makes, because uh, Chris, that's a loaded question you asked. Um, in terms of, do, does it have to have Hampton in the name to be a Hampton, Sag Harbor? Well, which begs the question, you know, what, what do the Hamptons mean? Is it, There's been Hamptons creep in, into the surrounding areas. When we do our episodes, um, Esperanza and I often talk about what we refer to as the bookends. The that's bookends right. being Southampton Village, and East Hampton Village. Fair or unfair, that's sort of, uh, you know, and again, we're going to probably, some of the west of the canal people may object, but, you know, for us, I would say that's the heart, if you will, of Eastern Long Island for us. Right. And and to Chris's point of the Hamptons creep, I mean, think about it, Hampton Bays, right? We've talked about this, was originally good ground. So it wasn't a Hampton. And Chris, that's what Esperanza's point is is very true. We've often discussed on our Hamptons podcast how um, the branding of the Hamptons. You know, you made a, a point just a, a minute ago about how you know I forgot how you phrased it, but it's how the, the term Hampton is expanding. You know, I I recalled when we would dr- I would drive back and forth from Up Island. I would go through the town of Brookhaven, and they would be Hamlets Brookhampton. Anything to yeah. take advantage of that name as to Esperanza's point, Good Ground, which was the original name of Hampton Bays. Apparently, they wanted that cachet as well. No, exactly. And, and to maybe get to some of your background, you have a nice intro where you say you're about preservation and, and you know, love of place. And, and, and it's very personal. What I take away from listening to you both is it's a very personal podcast you're doing. So do each of you in turn just want to say a little bit about what brought you to that microphone in terms of love of place and, and taking the leap into recording it for the public? I'm going to let Erwin take that first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In, in terms of... Um... 
be a, can you be a little more specific on the question, Chris, so I could give you a little sure, bit sure. more specific answer? So, well, I guess part one is where does your love of the Hamptons or, or your, your section of the Hamptons come from? And then how did you, what, what led you to parlay that into the podcast? I, I think for me, I won't speak for Esperanza, although I think we're on a very similar wavelength with this. Um, it's not about the Hamptons, the glitz, and all of that associated with it. We all know about the restaurants and the celebrities and the PR photos and and the branding. that We speak about this extensively on the show, but for us, it's really what we say in our intro – at least for me, it's about the history. This has such a... I'm from Up Island originally, originally from Queens, but I lived a, a good part of my life in Great Neck, Long Island. And sure, there's a history there, but it frankly doesn't have the history and the sense of place, for me anyway, that Eastern Long Island does. I think Irwin and I both, I'm going to say, are sort of you could call us history buffs. I mean, I think we just, we do get excited about things of the past, but that sense of place is predominant in everything that we really have discussed about history, about the present. Um, we're always talking about, you know, what used to be or in what the essence of what's, you know, what's still here. And so in conversations that we would have, it kind of led to this idea of describing why we have or why we give that significance and that importance to the sense of place and what makes that up. And so for me, originally being from Venezuela, you know, then coming as a very little girl to East Hampton directly, that sense of place was, you know, I, I still, it's so vivid to me. So the sense of place being those his, that historic architecture that I would see and we'd take field trips to see. And, and then of course I grew up with Bonnikers, you know, so this was a part of my past and to see that being lost year by year, decade by decade, really it's, it, it's not nostalgia so much, but mm, I guess just trying to express to people how we feel so that they can appreciate this as well and try to preserve that a little bit of it anyway. Yeah. And, and just to give you some context, I spent three years working at the Southampton campus of, of Stony Brook. So I would cross the canal every day. Um, I would, I would look both ways cause it was really, you're going on to another lens, yeah. right? Cause you're separated <laughs> from, and it has its own weather out there, you know, it would be snowing out there and, and the rest of the Island would be in another climb. Right. Right. Thank you, Hurricane of 1938, right? <laughs> Very true. And if I could just elaborate on a little bit of what Esperanza said, I think for me anyway, um, the sense of place is even more enhanced, if you will, because there's been so much change, uh, especially over the past few years. You know, we all know about the mad money and the development and the oversized houses and everything else. And it, and it truly is changing the physical face of Eastern Long Island, but also the character of the place. So I think for me, and I, I will even take poetic license and say for Esperanza, I think part of what we're trying to do is keep much of that alive, as much of it as we can. And and so in your own both of your own time frames, what what is in your heart? What stage of the Hamptons is the Hamptons that hooked you? Like in terms of fifties, sixties, seventies, was there anything you know particular about the the first time you saw the Hamptons or what you remember about it? That I mean, I always tell this story when I first we first came here. It was mid seventies, and it was still it was still a fairly rural spot. Um, but, you know, what's important to me about this place, and I think what captivated our whole family, was the ocean, the beaches, and the quietness of it all. And then that that natural beauty is really overwhelming sometimes. And it's not to say there aren't many beautiful places around the world, but somehow, I guess, especially for me at that age, there's still that I remember this distinctly when we rented this house in the Georgia area on Jericho Road and we got lost um, in the fog because at that time there's that certain time of year in like June 
that you get these sort of cold front meeting hot air and, and you get all this fog. And all I could smell was ocean air and strawberries. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, we're very, we have sensory memories. And I think the sense of smell is a big one, also visual. But I think that that really is like, I still to this day, I love a foggy day, you know, and, and I love that. That to me is like a, a thing that, and you were just saying it, this is like a whole other landmass. And you do have that here, you could be it could be raining in Wainscot and not in Springs, that kind of That's thing. True. So it's very, it's, it's very interesting. There are little microclimates, but I guess what I'm saying is that um, for me, the seventies was what captivated all of us um, because it was still fairly unchanged in so many ways. Great. And, and Erwin, how far do you go back? I came out here in 1989 Um I have some family out here slightly before that, but um, my, I always remember my father till his last day lamenting the fact that he bought a summer house. My Him and my mom bought a summer house in the Pocono Mountains because in his own words, I didn't even know this existed when we were growing up in Queens. But um, so I go back to 1989 and to answer your question for me, um, and it, is, it sort of extends on what Esperanza is saying about the physical beauty, the topography out here. And I think about when I would drive or walk or bike ride, for example, from the lanes of Amagansett down Bluff Road, driving to the east, and a forest would let into a dunescape. Literally instantly, like, like the... Mm. Esperanza and I use a term on on our Hampton Segway. The Segway was so is just so fast and it, it's not gradual. It, it just it just automatically like drastic. You're right, in deep it's drastic. woods, and then you drive a little or bike ride a little, and you're in a dunescape where it's sandy and and the temperature changes <laughs> and the temperature changes it, it, exactly. It's just it that topography for me is just extraordinary. Not to mention. When you go a little bit to the north, you know, we're, we're, even to the west in Watermill, you go to the northern parts of Watermill, which has very high elevation. You see the ocean from certain parts of Watermill in the northern end or northern Southampton. Um, the rapid changes in topography from dunescape to forest and, of course, to farmland. It's miraculous. And all of these years later, despite the pressures and despite the changes, it still puts a smile on my face. And when I make that turn, when I'm coming into East Hampton Village, I live in Springs, and pass that pond, it's like I'm home. And not to get too dark too quickly, but so what has been or what were the biggest changes of these vistas or these microclimates? How, how have you seen it change? You actually just led me because as uh, because as Erwin was speaking, I was thinking about how you had these vistas of because these were really plains on the southern side of Montauk Highway, you know, like endless vistas right to the ocean, just potato fields right down to the ocean, to the dunes. And I would say for me, that's the most drastic and abrupt in, not abrupt because it's, it's been gradual but it, it's abrupt in the sense of it jolts me still to see the change uh, where you have so much vegetation that has gone up like these walls that have blocked off those vistas and in fact where artists used to come out here because of the light this very atmospheric light which was basically I think, if I'm not mistaken, due to the fact that we're surrounded by bodies of water and there was no sort of obstacle in the way, so it was very atmospheric, has changed completely. There's still some of it left. I shouldn't say it's complete, but it just it's changed quite a bit because you don't have this sort of uninterrupted vista. And that to me is the most I don't know, upsetting change that has occurred. Yeah. So Erwin, maybe if you can add to that if you want, but just when you talk about the bookends of, of Southampton and East Hampton, so those two poles were sort of established colonies in a sense, and in between all this landscape we're talking about were pretty undeveloped? That's exactly right. That's And 
you know, we use the term the bookends of Southampton and East Hampton, and Esperanza, I think, would agree. You know, it's it's symbolically, metaphorically, all of the above, really. Um, those summer colonies, if you will, were established. They were there in the early part of the 20th century. Um, you had similar arguments that you even see today. Why are they making these houses so big? Why do they need eight bedrooms and 10 bathrooms? The arguments, the conversations were similar, but in between those two bookends, you know, stretching from Watermill to Bridgehampton to Sagaponic to Wainscott, you had farmland. And I always used to recall, and now look, while this is an ancient history, we were alive, at least I was, during the era of how Dan's papers used to refer to You could stand in the middle of Main Street, Bridgehampton in the 1960s and see the ocean Um, because it was, to Esperanza's point, that flat, just farmland, you know, from through the entire, the entire distance. Um, That change, and again, in our very first episode, Chris, we quoted Paul Goldberger, the architectural critic from the New York Times, where he said, East Hampton is not a museum. We're not frozen in time. We understand that. But that change from what was just pristine farmland, Suffolk County, I think it's still maybe the biggest agricultural county in the state, but back in the not too distant past, it was just extraordinary in the terms in terms of agriculture and so much of it was concentrated in this gorgeous environment between these beautiful hamlets where farmland literally ended at the Atlantic Ocean and the two of you have dropped some some words of what I've learned from your podcast was more so than most locales on Long Island this area comes with its own vocabulary so I, I'm going to read off some names, and maybe if you can translate for us. But you, I think, um, Esperanza, you already mentioned Bonnikers. Right, yes. And so what, what's how can we translate that for people that might not know? Well, okay, so the Bonnikers really are the people that, um, it's in East Hampton, but really are from the area around Akabonic Harbor. So in the Springs area where Irwin is. Um, that is really what is known as the boniker and, or the bub as they call them, because they call each other bubs. <laughs> uh, and they did, they had their own, I guess you could call it dialect, um, because they had passed down from generation to generation, the Kentish way of speaking, you know, English from Kent, which is where they originated. Um, so it was very funny. Like we, and we knew people that spoke this way. Um, you know, like instead of saying, um, Oh gosh, uh, (laughs) I'm trying to think like my mother always used to say this phrase of be working bub. And then the response would be, guess I be (laughs) something like that. You know, so I don't know how much of a mutation it was over the years, but it was just, it's, and I still, to this day, I will hear somebody speaking even faint bonic and I just get excited. And I think I read, I was doing some background. Um, there are some recordings I don't yes. know who was doing a project, but there's some recordings of it. Even if there's, are there many live speak living speakers or would you think it's dying out? Oh, I think it's, I, I'd say it's really dying out. And if there are, there are, I think there are, there's, I think there's one man who's uh, still carving away at his decoys and his name is escaping me right now, but I saw a video of him recently and he's pretty much speaks like that. I mean, not exactly, but yes. Yeah. And then you've got all the, you know, I mean, it was those, the farmers, the fishermen, and, and they all, they, they all did a little bit of everything. You know, this was a land, a very bountiful land. So whether you were farming or fishing, some were more fishermen, some were more farmers, but everybody did a little bit of everything and really lived off this land quite well. And Erwin, you mentioned Up Island, so I, I would imagine those people did not travel west much. So to them, that was up. Exactly. As a matter of fact, um, I would think so. Um, I'll add a little bit to the to the Bub conversation that Esperanza was elaborating on. Um, the Upstreeters, and the Upstreeters were really people that would reside in the village, 
And in earlier eras, earlier parts of the 20th, early to mid 20th century, there really wasn't that all that much lodging here. So uh, the upstreeters, meaning homeowners that lived in East Hampton Village proper, would rent their village homes and then decamp, no pun intended, to their camps, which used to be on places like Three Mile Harbor, a couple of miles to the north. Uh, usually these camps were unheated. It didn't matter. They were only there for the summer, but that's where the upstreeters used to go. Not to be confused with the bubs, because I don't believe they were going into springs. Um, maybe, you know, I don't know how far up north they were going, maybe just in the in the early parts of it, but um, those were upstreeters. So what were upstreeters, was that in any way pejorative or was it just kind of? It was, it was what they, they referred to themselves that village, they were, they were the, the, they were the residents living in the village. The village people. (laughs) The village people. Right. And, and hair leggers, which I think is what, Shelter Island based? Do you know hair leggers? Yes. Yeah. That's, we, we tend to be South Fork centric. We also admit to, uh, We've been trying to expand our horizons. We have done a lot of podcasts. We have a lot of upcoming ones in Southampton town. But being as Esperanza and I both live in East Hampton and it's really more of our comfort zone, we tend to skew that way. But we have gone uh, to Shelter Island. We have spoken to people. We did an episode about Hampton Bays, about Riverhead. So uh, we're expanding our, hey, Esperanza, what's that word you say? Ooh. <laughs> I did not know you spoke French so well, Erwin. <laughs> so maybe if we use that as a as a segue into talking about the podcast, Erwin, I, you were the driving force or the originator. Do you want to say how you, what gave you the bug? The bug really happened, Chris, um, a couple of years ago um, in the early part of 2021. I sold my business. I no longer work 60 plus hours a week by doing that. Um, My retirement plan, and I use the word retirement in quotes, did not include something like golf because then what would I do by Wednesday? So I was sort of thinking about things of of interest and I had a family member um, that actually does an award-winning podcast. I spoke with him, uh, you know, got a few tips. He sort of put me on, on the road to how to actually the nuts and bolts of going about this. And then I reached out to Esperanza. Now, Esperanza and I have known each other for over 20 years. Um, We actually met Esperanza, owned a wonderful art gallery. I became one of Esperanza's clients. And the conversations Esperanza and I used to have, uh, it started out predominantly about art, but it just morphed into conversations about virtually anything and everything, including our love and respect for Eastern Long Island. I think suffice to say, she and I, we just clicked. We had an instant chemistry together. And when I was thinking this, one day I called Esperanza and said, Esperanza, (laughs) what do you think about doing a podcast? And what did I say? I said, only if we're going to have fun. (laughs) Yes. Only as long as we're having fun. Right. I mean, we're we're not, we don't advertise on this podcast. We don't monetize this podcast in any way. We're doing it for fun. And, you know, my schedule is a little more flexible. Esperanza has a million balls in the air, including two young children, but somehow it's important enough to us that we make the time. No, and and it's achievement. I think I just downloaded, I guess it's your latest episode. You're up to about what, 39, 40? 38. 38. Okay. Wow. And it, you know, it's a testament to that. So you're having a lot of fun. It sounds like. <laughs> yes. Is, is there anything about the process that surprised either of you that you found interesting or, you know, maybe you hadn't thought of in terms of being a, a media, a member of the media in a sense, or, you know, putting your voice out there like you have? Esperanza, you want to take a crack at that? Gee, I don't know. I mean, I think that we had so much fun and we have had so much fun, just the two of us that, you know, one first hesitation was, you know, should we do guests? (laughs) But it became an idea that we did, we had, and we have pursued a few times to different levels of success. I think all have been interesting, but what I would say overall is 
there is just no shortage, I think, of topics that we could find to talk about, you know, and just when you think that you have run out or that you like, what's next? What should we talk about? What should we do? Something just drops in your lap, you know, whether it's in a conversation or reading an article in a magazine or a newspaper, and then you want to do the deep dive and and go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. I think Esperanza said that really perfectly. You know, I tend, because I have a little more time, I tend to act as the and I use this term loosely producer of the show. A lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll brainstorm about topics. Sometimes I'll research things. And to Esperanza's point, the topics are not always all that out in the open. They can be sometimes somewhat obscure. And as she sort of inferred, it could have been from a random East Hampton Star article or something else we've seen, you know, on social media or in the newspaper. And we'll go back and we'll start researching this and you just uncover just a wealth of information. And I think one thing that we really try, and it's something we mention a lot on our Hamptons podcast, is we try to transform and take our audience back in time. When we did an episode about Bridgehampton Commons, when that was built in 1972, we we tried to evoke the memory of the Hamptons Drive-In, the drive-in movie theater that it replaced. Um, in the northern sections of Bridgehampton, when there was actually a racetrack with world class, and again, not ancient history. I mean, we're talking 50s, early 60s. The premier auto racers in the world came and raced in Bridgehampton. And sometimes you would tell, we would tell these stories, and often we get emails or people just meeting people on the street. Wow, I never knew Bridgehampton had a racetrack. Yeah. Or you evoke that nostalgia or that memory and you get all the sort of the fan mail of, oh my gosh, I remember that drive-in and right. what I did and how we hid in the trunk. And <laughs> so it's fun either way because you're either awakening an appreciation and knowledge of something that a person didn't have before, or you're bringing back good memories. Uh, to Esperanza's point, I remember on our Instagram page, which is where we do most of our communicating along with our website, but our Instagram page, I remember posting an old picture of the Hamptons drive-in, and we must have had 20 comments yeah. on it, just because, look, we know drive-ins are disappearing all over the country. The land is too valuable. This is nothing unique, but that just struck a nerve, and people would re people in their 60s would relay stories of sitting on the roof of a car with their parents smoking inside, watching the movie. And it just struck something in people. And um, for me, that's been really, Chris, one of the most rewarding parts of doing this podcast, you know, bringing these stories to life, some that are a little more off radar than others, and having people respond to it and be moved by it will learn something by it. Um, that's a great post-work gig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, and I would add to that, like one of our, I think it was our first episode where we span, you know, there's, there's like that history of the place where we talk about uh, Poseyville, the Lesters, Emma Gansett, the you know, the Baymen. But then we are also talking about Handy Lane, which was this, you know, new development that, is really atrocious and how that has completely changed the character of this area that was, and is still, you know, was formerly occupied by all these families that were just fishermen, but now is a cul-de-sac of mini McMansions. And so that, as uh, Irwin was saying, transporting people, you know, you're going from historical uh, anecdotes and information to present day and the comments that people are making today about those things. So I, I like that part as well, because that's where you get, as we were talking about earlier about, you know, what's, what's changed, what's threatening, what's going on. That kind of episode is what I, I love to do that one. The response sounds like there's a, a lot of interest and maybe support for or hunger for, at least talking about this history, if not preserving it, does that, when you look at what's being lost or might be endangered, do you have any more hopeful outlook that maybe you're stirring up some some groundswell of, that might change some decisions in the future? 
uh, I think maybe in a very small way, um, we're raising some awareness of this. There has been a movement on Eastern Long Island organizations such as Build in Kind uh, and others that have been really trying to bring these issues to the forefront. But at the end of the day, Chris, it almost becomes an issue of zoning, mm. uh, an issue of building codes, and the wheels of government can turn slowly. And developers, spec developers are moving quickly. So it's not always in lockstep. And maybe we haven't lost the war, but we're certainly losing a lot of battles, I would say, Esperanza. Yeah. And I mean, it's really ultimately about money. And so, uh, you know, these, I've read real estate ads and they talk about the beauty of a little cottage and how poetic and this and that. And they, you know, it's very charming, all of it. And then they say, and <laughs> you could just tear it all down and, and dream up something completely new at 10,000 square feet, you know? So it's, it's really difficult to understand how there is perhaps that respect, if you want, like initially you get excited, like, oh, they're actually talking about the history of this place. And then they just have no hesitation to demolish it and uh, erase that history because it's about the bottom line and it's a commodity. Yeah. I, I've got two questions. One, I designed one for each of you. So, and, and one, Esperanza, yours kind of jumps off of what you were just saying. I, for a time, I worked in a, an old uh, Vanderbilt mansion uh, oh, yeah. in Oakdale. And, you know, there's no shortage of studies and, and t coffee table books and, you know, remembrances of the Gold Coast mansions and Gilded Age. Do you think history will ever look back at the mega mansions you're living among now and pay the same type of attention to them? We've talked about that, haven't we, Erwin? I mean, we talked about the Rennert house and how even somebody, I think, that represented that application or was an agent for that or the architect said, you know, well, you have all of these like Gold Coast places that have turned into museums. So we're picturing already 50 years from now, if it's still standing, if the ocean hasn't just absorbed everything on this island, um, that the Rennert House may be, I don't know, a, a museum, a retreat, you know, something else that it's not a private residence. But it's difficult for me to accept the thought that the amount or the number of large residences could possibly ever, you know, they can't all become museums. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just not... So I don't know, will they be share, you know, shared accommodations in the future? Because that's what's going to happen. And we'll just be more suburban, more and more every year. Maybe that's the future. I don't know. And then Erwin, the, the opposite of that question, since I heard you talk about trails, wh where are these trails and, and how did they survive? Or, how, you know, what do they cut through? Or tell us a little bit about the trails out there. Well, um, a lot of them, like in the town of East Hampton, the majority of our trails are between Nepeg, which is the eastern environs of Amagansett, and Montauk. Um, both of those parts of Long Island have enormous amounts of preserved land, whether it's county, state, town, but I don't know what the exact statistic is. I think Montauk is something like over 60% of the land is preserved, and I think Nepeg is close to that. So those trails are pretty much really in the woods, in deep woods, in large swaths of municipally preserved lands. Uh, the further to the west you go, then you're starting to get involved with easements and you're walking through subdivisions and all of this sort of thing. So while it's still a beautiful environment, um, you're not walking through virgin woods. You're seeing fences. You're seeing houses and things of that nature. We're grateful that these people have, have given us these easements, but it's a loss as compared to the trail system we have the further east you go. And then, you know, you take a place like East Hampton Village, which is basically developed, uh, completely developed. We have a little beautiful nature trail south of the highway, and that's about it you know, within the village proper. 
Yeah, everything has been privatized and more and more every day. That's another thing that yes. um, becomes hard to uh, accept because even if it was private property in years past, Nobody really cared if you went through their yard mm. on the dune or in the woods. But nowadays, people erect fences, even if they're not using that woodland, they will erect a fence to demarcate their properties and or, you know, come out and say, you're walking on private property. You can't come through here. And it's getting harder and harder to access a lot of places that used to be just kind of you could be free range. Yeah. To take Esperanza's point, and this is something we've discussed on some of our episodes, um, not just fencing and hardscape, we would see landscape material and we would marvel. Esperanza and I have had this conversation privately, (laughs) um, not just on the podcast. We would marvel at someone paying a premium to buy property adjacent to a swath of preserve farmland and then screen the property in, you know, with 20 feet, 20 foot high evergreens. So they don't see the beauty of the farm field that they paid a premium to live next to. They're, they're hunkering down. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. So I, any, anything we didn't get to that you wanted to get across, I mean, we still have time, but I just want to make sure anything you want to discuss about the podcast or, or the area I don't know. I I mean, I think that we still have so much that we could explore. Uh, in particular, you know, we tend to always go to a, a history that is very, mm, I mean, I guess you could say it's very white male dominated. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I'm always kind of pushing over, you know, I'd say, Erwin, what about this? You know, let's explore this uh, aspect or, um, you know, sort of hidden, as we have in the past uh, talked about things that are off the radar, I think we need to explore more of those hidden stories that a lot of people might not be as familiar with at, or if at all. Yeah. I'm going to touch on, to answer Chris's question, um, something he alluded to earlier in this broadcast. And it's something we, Esperanza and I will mention often on the podcast which is what we like to call our sweet spot. While we love the old history and we're, it's certainly fascinating, you know, from really from the 1600s and, and, and whatnot, you know, when the first settlers came and that's all well and good. But, but I think for us, our sweet spot really tends to be, I, I, won't even, I shouldn't even speak for Esperanza, I apologize, I shouldn't, even though I think she's going to agree with what I'm going to say, um, The era of the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, particularly I would even say the 60s, because now I was born in 1957, so I'm giving you my age. So these, I remember this era, and it's not ancient history. Uh, Another term we use on our Hamptons an awful lot, but that period of time, 60s, 70s, it was so much more unspoiled than it is now. And I'm not even just talking in terms of house sizes and everything else. There was just less. There were less people. There was more farmland. There was more open space. Um, we had a guest on our show, Tim Ferguson, who made a, who commented on this. And I remember what he said. It was a place during this era that was enjoyed by a relative few. And that always stuck with me. Because again, we're not talking the 1920s, you know, something that I can't relate to. We were talking the 60s and 70s. I was alive then. And this place was far more unspoiled than it is now. Well, and and the the other beauty that I see in that is you're mentioning the responses you get. You know, there are people alive that remember that or heard stories from their parents about that. So it's in living memory if, if people can capture it now before it's too late. Right. The the one thing that I would say about that is like, I wax nostalgic about, oh, I walked to school, you know, to elementary school through a potato field, probably covered in pesticides, but still, it was, very, <laughs> it was a potato field, um, which is today a parking lot. But the question that I, it lingers in my mind is how many people really care? Because there comes a time when a lot of people have been pushed out. A lot of people are profiting from 
the change uh, or the changes or, you know, make their living from the second homeowners. And so it's, it's like a, a difficult balance for me to, you know, to reconcile also those opinions of people that even if their families go generations back, mm, they are more accepting of the changes because it's kind of like they're resigned to it. Um, and that kind of makes me sad because I think maybe I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hold on to something that I shouldn't be holding on to that whole freezing of time. But um, I don't know. I, I would like to think that we are making a little difference in creating awareness and appreciation and the need to preserve at least the memories of these things. Um, not to stereotype, Chris, but I will tell you, a particular pet peeve of mine will be a newer resident, uh, second homeowner, uh, what have you, coming here and just the first question is inevitably of, hey, you have a good list of restaurants for me. Or do you have, uh, uh, there's, there's just so much more to this place than Nick and Tony's. And we love Nick and Tony's, but there's more to it than just that. And when you have people, these are educated people, affluent people, they come here, they have no idea of the history, of the sense of place, of the legacy of these families they think it's the Hamptons. And for me, it disturbs me. So if this podcast can bring out what was and some of these stories, that's my validation for doing it. Yeah. And, and like you said, you're not monetizing, you're putting it out for free. And so it, it lives in the ether and people discover it at different points, you know, at different points in their lives. So hopefully people will hear it. I, I don't want to leave us on too down a note. Do, do each of you want to suggest an episode for people to listen to? Oh my gosh. Oh gosh. Yeah. Wow. Esperanza, I may have to open my app and re review <laughs> all of the episodes. That is, that is such a, That's tough. that I is mean, such a tough question. I mean, I think the, um, I think the episode, we did a two part episode. I remember, and we mentioned it earlier about the Bridgehampton racetrack. I think for me, uh, that episode really was very evocative of a sense of time and place. We did an episode on the Sea Spray Inn, which was a beautiful grand hotel on the dunes in East Hampton Village, right next to Main Beach that burned to the ground, and we told that story. Leisurama, Sands. I mean, Chris, it's such a loaded question. I've I've loved all of these episodes. I, I Also, even when we kind of have some knowledge about the subject, there's always some kind of revelation or, you know, Erwin, I'll tell him a story and he's like, I didn't know that, you know, about mm -hmm. something I had experienced right. or knew or so it's, or vice versa. So it's, um, yeah, it's hard to pinpoint, but I, I actually, I have to say, I really, I think I, I loved our first episode and maybe it's just because that was like the the first episode. And I got, you know, people saying, wow, I didn't know about that. You know, like that was like a real eye opener of we're doing something mm -hmm. right here. Right. Proof of concept. Yes. And, and I love that you, you said that you're constantly finding ideas. That's what keeps me going because there's always something new and even revisiting, you know, I've done so many on the Culper spy ring and mm -hmm. Uh, I've done a few on square dancing because people contact me because their father was a square dancer at, in Hither Hills or something. I so. miss the square dancing out here. Whatever happened to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, the callers have been dying off, so I don't know if maybe there was no second next generation of, of square dancing. No callers. more dosy doing. Oh gosh. Yeah. Oh. Well, thank you both for for sharing and keep going. Thank um, you. It's great to have you out there. And, and Chris, if I can, because uh, I like the way you said uh, we don't want to end on, on a down note, and I would agree with that. Um, I'm going to state for the record, right here and right now, I still love this place passionately. How's that? That's great. And it's, it, does it still smell like strawberries? It, it does, actually, in, in, at a certain time of the year. <laughs> And I want to say thank you once again to Erwin and Esperanza. If you haven't already, make sure you are listening to them. You can find them at OurHamptonsPodcast.com, and we will have links in our show notes to related resources on this episode. 
And if you'd like to get in touch, if you want to share with us some research that you're doing or your own connections to Long Island history, a project you're working on, a family association, anything that touches on any part of this island and its long history, get in touch. We're at Long Island History Project at gmail.com. That does it for this episode. Our outro music is Capering by the Blue Dot Sessions, used under an Attribution 4.0 international license. And as always, thank you for listening.